So I'll be talking today about, uh, so I'm Peter Gashi for those that uh, don't know me, and uh, I'll be talking today about uh, Uroboros and Uroboros Prowse, which are the two proof of stake blockchain protocols uh, that you probably have already heard about. Uroboros is the protocol that is underlying the Cardano blockchain currently, and Uroboros Prowse is an uh, improved version of it. Uh, both of them are uh, separate papers that uh, have already been accepted to conferences. Uh, First, I should mention that uh, uh, the, those Uroboros blockchains are joint work with, uh, with Agelos, Alex Russell from Connecticut, uh, Bernardo, and Roman. Uh, and these guys are actually authors of the first Uroboros paper, and I joined the team uh, when we started working on Prowse. So, uh, a bit of a, of a sketch where we are going today. I will first, just to make sure we are on the same page, I will start talking about uh, uh, Bitcoin and proof of work, and uh, because this is the, uh, the deficiencies of, of the of the proof of work approach are actually what motivates proof of stake, and so I will sketch why uh, proof of work is probably not the best way to go, and why we should uh, turn to proof of stake, and what is the actual general pattern behind proofs of stake, and then I will spend most of the time discussing Uroboros, so I will try to give you a high-level overview of how the protocol works. Uh, in what model we are analyzing it, and also sketch some parts of how we argue about the security. Of course, not, not everything, but just to give you a gist of uh, how, this is, how this is done. Because uh, uh, as Phil said in every talk, there should be a part that is only understood by three people in the room, so probably this will, this will be here. And uh, then I will, from this, try to, uh, try to describe what are the differences uh, when we move from Uroboros to Prowls. Uh, and uh, what are, not only what, what is the difference in the protocol, but also what is the difference in the, in the goals that we achieve. So why is Prowse better? Uh, okay, so that's the plan. Uh, so let's start with, uh, with Bitcoin. I will go through this quickly because I believe most of you know how Bitcoin works. Uh, but just to be on the same page, we all know that this is an electronic currency that was uh, rolled out in 2009, actually, but proposed a year earlier. And uh, what makes it novel is the is the is the uh, that it provides a decentralized mechanism to maintain a ledger of transactions. And uh, how it does it is by uh, by including this novel security assumption that, uh, that the adversarial computing power is dominated uh, by the uh, by the power of the honest participants. This is a new assumption that was not before cons uh, considered and. Uh, and allows Bitcoin to uh, to enter this scene and do it and uh, realize something that uh, previously was not known how to, how to how to do, and of course this this breakthrough uh, um, induced a lot of uh, a lot of follow up work. Uh, there is a myriad of new cryptocurrencies coming to exist with uh, richer transactions, uh, with better privacy, with uh, different consensus mechanism, and this is actually the part we we will be looking at. So. Uh, there are several uh, or many ways in which you can improve Bitcoin, but we will be focusing on how to improve the consensus mechanism. Uh, uh, but the first question that a theory person should ask about Bitcoin is, uh, what is the problem that Bitcoin actually solves? And uh, one can see that the problem is actually, if you have a distributed collection of parties, how can they agree on this dynamic, dynamically updated common sequence of uh, Transactions, uh, this ledger, and uh, this was captured in formally in uh, in the GKL work, uh, GKL 15, uh, and uh, the two two properties that we that we expect from a ledger are uh, persistence, which intuitively means that uh, every transaction uh, that has been included into the ledger will stay there and will stay there in the same position where it was included. So this it's the ledger is immutable in some sense, and liveness, which means that uh, if I, as a participant in the protocol, want to include a transaction into the ledger, it will eventually get there, uh, which is, of course, somehow parameter parameterized. And such a ledger, we want to build in an environment where parties may come and go. Uh, this is also often called permissionless setting, where anyone can join and uh, run the protocol and then leave. 
and of course in the face of a potential adversary that might actively try to disrupt the system. And the way Bitcoin does this, of course, as we all know, is uh, by keeping this ledger in a structure co called a blockchain, which consists of a genesis block, which uh, contains an, which is an agreed upon starting point of the blockchain uh, that all parties are aware of, and then a sequence of blocks which actually contain the contents of this ledger, uh, so these transactions. But on top of them, each, each block also contains a hash of the previous hash uh, of the previous block and therefore uh, uh, commits to the entire history of the, of, uh, of the ledger. Uh, and if you look at it like this, uh, the main uh, challenge that, that you, have to, you have to somehow figure out when you are trying to design such a protocol is uh, how these parties could agree on addition of new blocks. Uh, so how to achieve consensus on, uh, uh, on changes uh, of the state of this ledger. And uh, the reason this is, this is uh, an intriguing problem is because it's outside of the classical distributed computing models. Uh, because talking about majority of players is not useful in this setting when any, anyone can join and anyone can leave. This is, this is the well-known Sybil attack problem where the attacker could just uh, spawn a lot of identities and uh, overload uh, uh, the set of parties and uh, uh, formally achieve majority in any counting that doesn't that only depends on identities of the players. Uh, and the, the way Bitcoin solves this, again, just, just to have a bench, just to have a common ground to compare then. Uh, so the way Bitcoin uh, achieves, uh, solves this problem is uh, by com combining two things. The first one is proof of work. So every block contains a work tons that, uh, that has the property that when you hash the whole block, uh, you get a particular number of zeros. So this, uh, this certifies that you invested a huge or a significant amount of work to create this block. And then the second part of this, of this solution is the longest chain rule, which, uh, which tells you that if you are supposed to choose between many chains, you simply take the one in which uh, the highest amount of work was invested. Uh, and these two things together allow you to allow the parties to arrive at a consensus about uh, what is the actual state of the ledger. Uh, and so the Bitcoin protocol from a, f uh, from a high level looks, uh, looks like this. Basically, if you are a party, what you do is you just collect all the transactions that you see on the network. You collect all the chains that you see uh, being, uh, being gossiped around on the network. You adopt the longest one of them that is valid according to whatever rules, I mean, a concrete set of rules that you have for the transactions that are in the chain. Uh, and then you try to, to extend this chain by, by trying to mine a new block by trying to solve this uh, proof of work. And if you succeed, then you just broadcast it and everyone else, according to the rules that I said, uh, will adapt your new block and, and uh, the state has just been updated. Uh, and when we try to characterize what this mechanism actually achieves, uh, it's often called eventual consensus. Uh, why eventual? Uh, because if we have an adversary that actually would want to uh, attack, for example, the persistency of the transaction, so uh, uh, a particular transaction that has already been included into the ledger, uh, if, uh, if the attacker wants to revert this transaction, he would have to create an alternative block that doesn't contain this transaction, of course. Uh, but then, to satisfy the longest chain rule, to convince everyone else that actually the yellow block is the, the right new state of the ledger, he would have to create a longer chain than, than the previous one. Uh, but of course, he's uh, unlikely to do it if he commands a minority of computational power because all the other parties are at the same time trying to extend the, the blue chain. Um, and this is what makes the transactions increasingly immutable. So there is not a, like a strict zero one uh, switch from, uh, from uh, not being included in the ledger to, to being included there. Uh, it's more like uh, this eventual process and that's why we call it eventual consensus. Uh, and another uh, view that, that, uh, um, that is useful when you are looking at, uh, at Bitcoin and that will be useful when we will be looking at uh, Ouroboros is uh, that you can see it as a, as a lottery where all these parties are, uh, or an election process, where all these parties are uh, competing for uh, having the right to create the next block. And the probability that they succeed in this uh, election or in this lottery is proportional to their computing power. So. Uh, as I said, Bitcoin was an uh, ingenious, uh, uh, or is an ingenious uh, design, but, uh, and 
to say some good things about it. It's a, it's a surprisingly simple way to, to solve this complicated problem of achieving a consensus with a fluid population of participants. Uh, and it sidestepped these previous uh, impossibility results. We believe that something like that uh, would be hard to achieve. Uh, and, and this is sidestepped thanks to this honest majority of computational power assumption. This is something that, 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 uh, that uh, Bitcoin relies on. And uh, it can be formally analyzed. So we now have a reasonably good understanding of what are the guarantees, at least in the cryptographic model uh, of Bitcoin. There, are, there is this sequence of papers where the first one analyzed Bitcoin in a uh, synchronous setting, uh, then the semi-synchronous, and then there is a, also a UC characterization of the functionality that, that Bitcoin uh, achieves. Uh, but uh, of course, Bitcoin is not the final answer, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Uh, and the main problem, at least from this perspective with Bitcoin, is that uh, it relies on this computational race that I just described. And so as Bitcoin grows, uh, also more and more resources have to be invested into, into maintaining the network, into, uh, uh, into, uh, into computing these proofs of work so that, uh, so that uh, the majority of honest computational power is maintained and so that the, this lottery that I described can carry on. Uh, this can be quantified. I, uh, I'm not sure how precise these estimates are, but uh, it seems that the consumption of energy of the, the Bitcoin network is on the order of units of gigawatts, which is roughly uh, uh, about a million of US homes and, uh, and how much uh, an entire country of, say, Iceland uh, consumes. And what is even more worrying about this is that uh, also these estimates confirm what, what theory says, that is that as Bitcoin is growing, so is this consumption growing. So it seems that uh, these estimates, I mean, no, it seems, these estimates did actually like triple over the last six months, the estimates of the energy that is burned by Bitcoin. So this doesn't, uh, that this clearly doesn't seem to be sustainable. Uh, so there is an obvious challenge for the theoreticians and practitioners uh, to try to replace this proof of work uh, lottery with some alternative resource lottery. Uh, and there have been several uh, ideas uh, in the past coming from the Bitcoin community, from the academic community, and so on. Uh, some ideas were uh, to replace the resource that is used in this lottery, the computational power, by something else. For example, disk space, or maybe at least make the computation useful, or use, uh, use some useful storage as, as the resource that is being uh, uh, used to back these elections that I described, uh, but uh, um, but from my perspective and from the perspective of many others, uh, actually the ultimate uh, resource that uh, that could be used to replace proofs of work is is a virtual or abstract resource, one that uh, doesn't actually cost us any real physical resources. And uh, an ideal option for that is the coin itself, uh, because the the blockchain already contains. Uh, the balances of all the participants, so it contains an accounting of how this resource is distributed. So this is a perfect, uh, perfect resource to be used as a, as the underlying uh, resource for uh, uh, for these elections. And this is this is the the central idea of proof of stake. Uh, and so I will this, but. Uh, Okay, uh, so, so this, is, this is the intuition, but it turns out that when you, when you actually want to implement this, it gets, uh, uh, not so surprisingly, uh, more complicated than that, and the devil is actually in the details, as usually. Uh, so I will try to guide you through what are the main challenges when you want to design a proof-of-stake protocol and, uh, and how Ouroboros deals with them. So the idea, as I said, is to to transition in this, uh, in this uh, election process uh, to virtual resources. And so the first like a Stroman proposal could be, well, if we want to add a new block, let's just uh, select the one particular uh, single unit of this currency, uh, like the smallest unit. Uh, we select it uniformly at random, and then we just look who owns this, this unit, and this will be the guy that is allowed to create the next block. Uh, this was originally called follow the Satoshi, because Satoshi is the smallest unit in Bitcoin. Uh, this results into the participants being elected proportionally to their stake, so that looks awesome. We just got rid of the physical resources and, and we should be done. Uh, the, the difficulty here is that if we want to sample from this distribution, 
uh, we actually need randomness, right? We need some randomness that uh, is unbiased and that all the parties in the, in the protocol agree on. Uh, it's really important that the adversary doesn't have uh, the power to bias this randomness in a significant way because then he could basically bias these elections, make him the winner of the elections and basically hijack the whole chain. Uh, and if uh, people were thinking about how to, how to get this randomness, or, uh, uh, or yes, uh, the first idea that basically comes to mind is just use the blockchain itself. We already have some uh, actually a reasonable amount of uh, randomly looking data in, uh, in the blocks of the, of the blockchain. Uh, so maybe we could just uh, hash the blockchain. Uh, this will give us this uh, concrete coin. We will look who owns the coin and this will be the person that uh, is allowed to create the new, new block, right? Uh, but this actually turns out it doesn't work. Uh, so I will just uh, sketch why it doesn't work so that you can appreciate that actually one has to look at the details quite carefully. So the problem is, of course, uh, uh, something that is called rejection sampling. So what the adversary can do, uh, he can, if, if it's his turn already to create a block, so imagine he was lucky once, he won the lottery, he can create a block. He just tries to create a block. Uh, he does the hashing himself, himself privately. He looks how, what is the outcome. And if it's not him who is the winner for the next step, he just drops the block and doesn't tell anyone about it and tries to create a different block. And he repeats this process until uh, he gets lucky and uh, he turns out to be uh, the winner of, for the next round as well. Uh, and at this point, he publishes this block uh, and this, makes him, uh, this gives him the right to create the next block as well. And he can just repeat this process and hijack the chain forever. So rejection sampling, or this is also sometimes called the grinding attack. There are several variants of it, but uh, this is uh, like a simplification, simplified cartoon of, uh, of a particular grinding attack. Uh, this represents a problem to these to this naive approaches that, that I just described for deriving the randomness for the election process. Uh, there are several proof of stake proposals that uh, that uh, derive, that give rigorous guarantees about their security and also therefore in particular about the process how they derive the, the randomness. Uh, one is Uroboros that I will discuss in, uh, in detail uh, and now I will just, uh, just uh, describe how they deal with this, with this randomness problem in a very, very general terms. So what Uroboros does is uh, it implements a secure multi-party computation uh, on top of the blockchain, using the blockchain as a communication medium. And the outcome of this, uh, of this computation is uh, clean randomness that can be used to, to generate further, to sample further, further leaders or further winners of these elections. Uh, and this randomness is unbiased as long as the majority of the, of the participants in this MPC is, uh, is honest. I will go into details uh, later in the talk. Uh, then there is another class of protocols uh, which includes Snow White and uh, Uroboros Prowse, uh, which I will also talk about. Uh, uh, these protocols approach this problem differently. They do use hashing, but uh, in a much more careful way. And uh, they also come with a, uh, with a formal analysis that uh, show that uh, this hashing, uh, this grinding problem or, or rejection sampling problem can be contained and uh, cannot harm the security properties of the uh, of the protocol, so I will briefly talk about that as well. And then uh, another, a different class of uh, protocols, or a particular single protocol, uh, that also is a, is a proof of stake protocol with rigorous guarantees coming from academia, is uh, Algorand. Uh, this one has a very different approach. It uh, aims to achieve a complete consensus uh, for every block. Uh, and so uh, there is a several round protocol running for every block. But why I mention it here is that uh, it also needs randomness for, for a similar reason as, as the protocols that I described to you. And uh, it uh, also uses hashing and uh, also needs to uh, provide an analysis why, uh, why grinding, grinding attacks are not a problem or not a problem that couldn't be contained. Uh, so this is, uh, this is like a common team uh, for all these protocols that we need to get reasonably clean randomness to be able to sample future winners of these elections. And there are also a lot of proof of stake solutions kind of in the wild, wild being implemented. Uh, I just listed some of them. 
but uh, what is interesting about uh, so these usually come without without any any provable analysis uh, but what is interesting is that as far as I'm aware the only intersection between uh, proof-of-stake protocols that uh, do have provably uh, provable security guarantees and proof-of-stake protocols that are implemented the only in, uh, element in this intersection set is uh, is Ouroboros in Cardano as far as I know so let me talk about that protocol uh, in greater detail now uh, really a high-level view so Ouroboros uh, is analyzing a model where we assume synchronous time and communication I will uh, detail on what, the, uh, what we mean by that and uh, it provides persistence and liveness the two properties that I described to you if uh, the three assumptions below are satisfied so if the adversary has minority of stake throughout throughout the whole execution if the adversary is subject to a corruption delay so the adversary cannot uh, corrupt uh, participants immediately it takes some time before between when he decides that th I would like to corrupt this party and the party uh, and the time when the party actually gets corrupted and the stake shifts are happening at a bounded rate so so the stake is not shifting too quickly, uh, for example, from honest parties to adversarial parties. Uh, so the communication model, uh, in slightly greater detail, how uh, the model in which we analyze Ouroboros, or in which Ouroboros is analyzed, uh, is synchronous, which means uh, participants have synchronized watches. Uh, the time is divided into slots. Uh, in the implementation, a slot is actually 20 seconds. Uh, and uh, any message that is being sent by an honest player is assumed to arrive to all other honest players within, uh, within uh, the same slot. Um, and uh, by the description of the protocol, all honest communication is happening via broadcast. Of course, in practice, this broadcast has to be implemented somehow by peer-to-peer -peer, uh, gossiping. Uh, but uh, the protocol basically uh, assumes that all all messages are uh, of the honest parties are spread by by broadcast, but uh, of course the adversarial parties can uh, can send arbitrary messages to arbitrary parties uh, at arbitrary times and so on. So this is the communication model, and uh, let me now sketch how uh, Ouroboros actually works. So so th the time uh, the time that consists of this. Consi uh, of these slots, 20 second slots that follow uh, one another, is actually split, split into bigger, uh, bigger time intervals called epochs. So an epoch is a sequence of R slots. Uh, you can see, uh, and so each of these colored boxes is, uh, is, a, is a separate epoch. And uh, what the protocol does is that actually for each of these epochs, uh, it, for each of the slots in this, uh, uh, in this epoch, it samples a slot leader who will be the party that is allowed to, the only party, the unique party that is allowed to create a block in that particular slot. And everyone will be aware that it's only this party that is uh, able to create, uh, create this block and then therefore uh, uh, it, uh, the parties will require that these blocks are signed by these, by these uh, slot leaders. And, and how, to, how to choose these slot leaders? Uh, that's an instance of this lottery that I have just described you. So we need two things for that. We need a stake distribution from which we will be sampling. So we, so actually, when we want to decide who will be the slot leaders for this yellow epoch, what we do is we take a sl uh, stake distribution from a particular point in this blue epoch. So from one in which there is an agreement on what exactly is the stake distribution at a particular point. Uh, this is fixed and will be used for sampling the slot leaders throughout the whole yellow epoch. And uh, except for the distribution that we are sampling from, we also need randomness to, to do the sampling, right? Because everyone has to agree on how the sampling, sampling ended up. And so the randomness for sampling slot leaders from, for this yellow epoch will come from the multi-party computation that will be run in this blue epoch. Uh, so basically, the blue epoch gives us both the stake distribution to sample from and the randomness to be used for the sampling. And this allows us to sample a complete leader schedule, which is just a sequence of leaders for each of the slots of the yellow epoch. Uh, so this is, uh, in broad terms, how the protocol works. 
Uh, and if we want to analyze the protocol, actually, uh, in the talk I will take the approach that is already uh, that is also taken in the paper. We first look at a simpler case where we analyze one simple, single epoch only, and then we somehow bootstrap the analysis to uh, to cover several epochs uh, uh, or the full protocol as I as I described it here. So, if we look at uh, simple. Uh, uh, single epoch. This is the, what we call the static static case. Uh, then this case uh, looks as follows: uh, the stake is static because, as, as I told you, the stake distribution uh, that is used for sampling all the slot leaders in a particular epoch uh, is, is fixed from the previous epoch. So this static uh, static setting looks as follows: uh, we have a fixed static stake distribution. Uh, we have an ideal randomness. Both of them are considered to be known by everyone, and uh, you can imagine them being written in a particular genesis block, genesis block, uh, together with the public keys of the players, and uh, uh, and then we just run the protocol for for this R slots, uh, which correspond to one epoch. So basically, we start with a with a fixed stake distribution and a fixed randomness, and we look at uh, how the protocol goes. So. Let's let's take a look at that. How the protocol will go in this one particular epoch? Uh, it will first determine the slot leaders. This is done by a fixed function L that is uh, everyone is aware of, and this function simply takes the randomness that was included in the in the genesis block and sample these individual slot leaders for each of the slots in such a way that each sl uh, each slot leader is sampled independently and uh, proportionally to his relative, relative stake. So if you own 1% of the coins, you have a 1% chance of being the, the slot leader. And since the function L is public, this whole, uh, and, and the randomness is public as well because it comes from the blockchain, or from the Genesis block actually in this, in this static case, uh, the leader schedule is public as well, right? So everyone knows who is a leader in which, in which slot. Uh, then, we call a particular chain valid in this setting if it starts with this with this genesis block, and uh, it, it is this block is followed by a sequence of uh, other blocks that are associated with increasing block numbers, uh, slot numbers. So you can have only at most one block per slot, uh, and of course, if these blocks uh, maintain some consistency in the sense that the conflict, the transactions included are not conflicting, and each of the blocks. Uh, needs to be signed by the respective slot leader from the, from the leader schedule that I already described to you how it is sampled. So, so it's important to note that we don't need to have a block in each of the slots, but we have at most one block in each slot. And this is how a block looks uh, in very <laughs> broad uh, terms. Uh, like conceptually, it just contains the transactions, uh, a commitment to the previous block in the form of the hash, and the slot number, and uh, it has to be signed by the by the by a leader that was elected for that particular uh, for the slot with that particular slot number. Um, and then the protocol is actually very similar to Bitcoin, and that's that's uh, per, uh, on purpose. So. Uh, how it works on, on a high level is that it just collects all the transactions from the network. Uh, it collects all the, all the, again, all the blockchains that are being broadcasted, uh, keeps only on the valid ones, uh, and uh, maintains the, the longest one as its current state. And if, it, if the participant finds out that uh, he is a leader according to the, to the leader schedule, uh, he will add a new block for that particular slot in which he's the leader and broadcast it to, assign it of course, that's important, and broadcast it to everyone. And so it's worth noticing now that this is a longest chain rule protocol, just like Bitcoin, and, uh, and aims for an eventual consensus. This is something that was already clear from what I said, but it's good to, to realize that. But there are important differences uh, compared to Bitcoin, namely uh, the adversary who, uh, controls a particular subset of the parties that uh, uh, that uh, are a minority by, by assumption. Uh, uh, so the adversary has more power than in the, in the Bitcoin case for several reasons. So first, it knows the entire sequence of the leaders ahead of time. Uh, um, 
this is this is because the the, the leader schedule is public, as I said. And uh, second, it can generate multiple blocks for a particular slot without any any effort, right? Because generating a block, if you are a slot leader, this just costs you one signature. This is very different from Bitcoin, where you actually have to invest a lot of work to to create the proof of work. So the adversary has more capabilities here, and uh, we need to understand uh, whether this actually significantly improves his power and uh, the, the proof in the in the paper actually shows that uh, despite having this uh, greater power the adversary is not able to violate the properties that we care about so persistence and liveness of the of the ledger that is realized by this protocol uh, I will now briefly go into into how this is proven uh, and for that we need some we need some some uh, we need to introduce some some notions um, so an important notion is a is a characteristic string. This is a this is a binary string that consists of uh, well, zeros and ones. Uh, it's of the uh, it, it's uh, its length is r. That's the number of slots. And basically, zero in this slot means that the leader that was elected for the uh, uh, for the slot on that position is honest, and one means that the leader is adversarial. So this is just a binary string. Uh, that is binomially distributed. Uh, zeros are more are assumed to be more likely than ones to appear because we are we have this assumption that uh, there is an honest majority of stake. And the obvious hope is that uh, since the probability is uh, skewed towards zeros, we will also see more zeros than ones. And therefore, uh, maybe this is enough to guarantee good properties of how how the execution will will be happening. And this is something that needs to be analyzed, of course. And uh, if we look at what we want to prove about the protocol, uh, it's of course in, in in the long run we want to prove persistence and liveness of the of the ledger that uh, that is uh, being stored in this blockchain. But uh, it's uh, it's known from previous work that there are actually three more basic properties that do imply persistence and liveness. It's a common prefix, chain quality, and chain growth. Uh, where common prefix means that uh, any two chains that are that were possessed by honest parties at some point uh, have the property that if you remove uh, uh, k blocks from one of them, you will get a prefix of the other one. Uh, so basically, any two chains do not differ by more than uh, in any other place than the last k blocks of it. Of them, uh, then chain quality is a property that says that. Uh, if a chain is uh, possessed by an honest party, uh, any chain that is possessed by an honest party in the last k slot uh, blocks contains actually a block that was uh, honestly generated. Uh, this is important in the analysis. And chain growth is what you would uh, probably expect. Uh, it's just a guarantee that that during the run of the protocol, uh, there will be some rate at which the, the chain will be growing. Um, the most difficult to prove is actually the common prefix property, and that's also the one I will briefly uh, talk about or go slightly more into detail now. Uh, but first, let's let's try to get some intuition about how it looks when when this protocol is exe executed. So let's let's try to look at a, at an example run. So uh, here we have the genesis block, and here we have a particular epoch of length 9. Uh, this is the characteristic string. So zeros mean that the slot is, uh, uh, is uh, the slot leader is honest. One means that the slot leader is adver adversarial. And so what will be happening? The first slot leader simply uh, is expected to create a block. So he does. And he, he uh, the pointer to the previous block will be simply the pointer to the, to the genesis block, because uh, this, is the only, this is the only block that the, that the party knows about. But then, then it's the turn of the adversarial party, and what what that party can do, it can pretend that it hasn't seen the block from the honest party, or just ignores it, and uh, creates an like an alternative uh, block uh, that is connected to the genesis block. Then it's the honest uh, party again, and uh, to be on the safe side in the analysis, what we assume is that if so, we know that by the protocol, the honest party needs to extend the longest chain it has seen so far. But if it, if it sees several longest chains, as in this case. We leave it at the. Uh, we leave it to the adversary to decide which which of them the the uh, the honest party will actually extend. So, for example, maybe now the adversary decides that uh, the honest party wants to extend this chain, then it's uh, adversarial party's turn again, then it's an honest party's turn, uh, 
again, the, the adversary decides which of the two equally aligned chains uh, it will extend. Now what the adversary can do, since it is uh, cheap for him to create blocks, he can create, uh, retroactively create blocks in the past slots that, uh, that uh, have already passed and show this to the honest player that is currently the slot leader and trig him into extending this new additional chain. This can happen. Uh, then it's an adversarial turn again. He might choose not to create a block at all. In the next one, he might, for example, create a, a block like this, and this might be the outcome of the run, for example. Uh, so this just shows that even in this simple setting, when, when we have a fixed stake and we, we have the clean randomness assumed in the, in the Genesis block, uh, the dynamics is non-trivial. And uh, these different paths in, the, in this graph, in this tree, uh, basically correspond to different histories. So there needs to be, what we need to prove is that there will be an eventual consensus on which of the paths is the correct one. Uh, and it cannot happen that we have several competing, uh, competing histories, which means competing paths uh, of the same length for a long time. This is, this is something that we need to exclude. Otherwise, uh, consensus would not be achieved. And uh, there is a particular uh, calculus or framework that is introduced in the paper to, to formally prove this. Uh, the central notion of that is a fork. So a fork is a, is a graph like this, a, a tree, uh, which is an abstraction of which block builds on top of which other blocks uh, during the execution of the protocol. So each execution leads to a particular fork. Uh, so it's, it's a graph, as you would expect, the nodes correspond to blocks and the edges correspond to this predecessor relation. Um, the root of this, the tree is the genesis block, uh, honest blocks are these double circled uh, nodes and uh, adversarial blocks are this single circled. Uh, nodes are labeled with their slot numbers and uh, each node has a unique edge from, uh, to, a, to a node with a smaller label, of course. Uh, what is important is that uh, we know that according to the protocol, all play according to the network assumption, all players hear all honest broadcasts, and honest players speak at most once in every slot because they follow the protocol. And this implies that any honest slot is associated with exactly one honest node. So there is at most one node per slot. And the uh, depth of any honest block exceeds that of all previous honest blocks because the party creating it has already heard about all other previous honest blocks, thanks to the broadcast. And so, uh, formally, a fork is a characteristic, uh, is a, uh, for a, a fork for a characteristic string, so for a binary string, is a labeled rooted tree uh, where each, lab, uh, each node is labeled with an element uh, indicating this, uh, the slot. And uh, root is labeled with zero, edges are directed away from the root, uh, labels increase uh, along the paths, and uh, honest slots uh, label a unique vertex, and honest depths increase. So these are the conditions that we can extract from how the protocol runs and how the model, uh, the communication model, uh, what it guarantees us. And now we are going to look at all these possible forks. So for a particular uh, characteristic string, we look at the set of all possible forks, all possible graphs that fulfill all these properties, and we want to argue that, uh, that they, there is none that would have a bad property. So let's take a look what a bad property would mean. So again, if we want to prove common prefix, which is our goal now, uh, uh, we want to argue that for a characteristic string that is being sampled according to this uh, binomial distribution that I, that I told you about, uh, it is unlikely that the adversary can violate common prefix. This is the goal. But, but the way how we get there is actually we look at the, at the set of all forks, of all these graphs that, that correspond to a particular characteristic string. And we argue that, uh, as I said, uh, uh, with high prob probability over sampling this characteristic string, we will get a string that does not permit any fork that would have a bad property, where bad property is basically widely diverging paths because this corresponds to two variants of history that are different for a long time. This is something we don't want. And actually we can focus on the most extreme case where, uh, where the fork has two disjoint paths that have the same maximum depth and well, they are disjoint, which means they split from each other already at the beginning. 
Uh, I will later tell you why we can only focus on this, but for now, uh, let's believe it. Uh, and then the, uh, this allows us to define that the, f that the string, uh, like this one, uh, is forkable if it allows a fork that, that does have this bad property, that does have two disjoint uh, paths of maximum, uh, maximum depth. So here is an example string, uh, three zeros, three ones, three zeros. So the adversary only controls one third of the slots uh, in, this, in, this, uh, in this string. Uh, but nonetheless, it turns out that this string is actually forkable. Let's, let's take a look why that's the case. So first, it's the turn of the honest parties. And what they do is they create their three blocks uh, according to the protocol. Then it's the adversarial turn. And the adversary is free to do whatever he wishes. So he just creates a, a, a second, uh, second path uh, independent of the first one. Uh, then he decides what the on, what, which one of these two paths should be extended by the honest party because, uh, because they are of this equal length. So he decides to extend the upper, upper path. And what he can then do is uh, expose create three blocks in his own slots uh, on the lower path. And uh, we end up with two paths that are of the same length. And they are of length six. They are maximum. In maxima, this is the maximum, maximal length uh, within the fork. And uh, they are disjoint. They, uh, their only intersection is the genesis block. And this is, this is exactly what we don't want to end up with. And so we call such strings forkable. And we want to avoid forkable strings. Okay? Uh, something just happened. Sorry, it seems that oh, okay. The network was done, and uh, yeah, the slides are online, which is probably not a good idea. Uh, okay, sorry. Uh, right, so we just observed that this string, even though, even though it consists of uh, just one third of adversarial slots, uh, is forkable. And uh, actually, it's uh, not so difficult to observe that uh, no string of density less than one third is forkable. So this is like a corner case. But on the other hand, naturally, all strings of density more than one half are forkable. Uh, because if the adversary controls the majority of the slots, he can just ignore what the honest parties do and just create his own chain on the side. And this will create a fork, uh, like um, make, the, make the string forkable. Uh, so it would be easy to argue about, about uh, characteristic strings that have at most one third uh, uh, adversarial slots. But we want to resilience against adversaries that go up to one half of uh, stake. And this. Uh, this turns out to be much more tricky. So in particular, we need to argue about the probability distribution of the, of the, uh, of the characteristic string. So we know that even uh, a, a string with one third of adversarial slots can be forkable. So we need to argue that it's, it's very unlikely that we will end up with these strings some, in this interesting region between one third and one half. Okay? And this is something that is actually done. Uh, in, uh, in the original paper, there is a bound which is improved by, by Alex Russell in a, in a separate paper, uh, which shows that if we choose this, uh, this uh, characteristic string according to this uh, binomial distribution, uh, then the probability that the string is forkable decreases exponentially with the length of the string. Uh, and this, together with a, with a not so difficult reduction showing that uh, if, the, if the string permits uh, violation of the common prefix, uh, then there must be a forkable substring of, uh, of the particular length of, of this common prefix violation. This is, just a, and this is just the observation that says that, well, if you have a run of the protocol that, where you have a split of the common prefix at some point, then at this point you can just look at the characteristic string and this will be a forkable string. So together with this reduction, uh, we end up at uh, the theorem that we want, which shows that uh, common prefix uh, violation is uh, probability uh, decreases exponentially with the length of the, uh, with the number of the, of the slots. Uh, let me see. Okay. 
uh, right, so uh, I will briefly, briefly talk about how this is proven. I will not go too much into the details, but uh, it's, it's proven by a, a Martingale argument. So we, we, we talk about uh, a particular uh, feature that, uh, that characterizes how, how these, uh, these forks develop as we are adding more and more, more, and more slots at the end. And the, the, the feature that we will be looking at is a two-dimensional quantity reflecting uh, the parameters of the best and the second best path. Uh, so we will always be looking at the, the longest path in this, in this fork and the second longest one, basically. And uh, uh, what we will do, we, we will be looking at whether the adversary is able, if he would invest all his, uh, all his uh, power, meaning all the slots that he has under his control, whether he would be able to, to extend the second longest chain uh, that is, uh, that is uh, disjoint from the main longest chain uh, in sufficiently to make it as long as the longest chain. And that's, that's bad because that's, that's exactly what a forkable string is. Uh, and uh, it turns out that these quantities can be followed throughout the, the characteristic string in an inductive way and can be described uh, by, uh, this process can be described by a, by a martingale and then uh, the probability that this is true, that the, the second longest path can actually be extended to the longest path can be, can be upper bounded by an exponentially decreasing quantity uh, uh, by analyzing this martingale and applying Azuma's inequality. So I will not, I think I will skip this analysis. Uh, let me just say that uh, chain growth and chain quality are then easier to, to establish uh, compared to common prefix. Uh, chain grow in particular is very easy because whenever an honest part is, whenever there is an honest party's turn, thanks to the synchronicity assumption, we know that, uh, that the honest party is aware already of the, like, the deepest uh, previous honest block, and so it will only create a block that is at least, at least uh, that has the depth at least uh, higher by one. And so the, the, the chain always grows with an honest, uh, with an honest slot. And uh, chain quality can also be reduced to common prefix in this particular case. And this then allows us to uh, derive persistence and liveness as well. Uh, so this would be for the, for the static protocol, for just the case where we have a static state distribution and we have a randomness that has uh, fallen from the sky and we know it's secure. But now we need to move to a setting where we have several uh, consecutive epochs, as I described you, where the stake distribution is changing between the epochs and the randomness has to be regenerated again. So as I told you, the stake distribution will be just taken from the previous epoch, just a snapshot in a particular time. But the randomness, we need to get it somewhere. And uh, as I already said, the idea is that uh, the protocol uses a secure MPC to generate it. And uh, the blockchain itself is used as a me medium of communication for running this MPC protocol. Uh, that will give us the, the clean randomness. Uh, just uh, one slide or two slide overview of how this MPC works. So uh, it uses a, a primitive called publicly verifiable secret sharing, which is a, which is a protocol for a dealer and the family of players where the dealer basically chooses a value S and produces shares of this value. And uh, the protocol has this property. The players, and well, the distributes these shares to the players. And the players can check that these values are valid. So they do reflect a consistent value. There is a value that the, that the, that the dealer has, has distributed to all of them. And if the majority of the players decide, they can reconstruct this value together from their shares. But the, the minority of the players together can learn nothing about the, about the secret value. And so if we want to use this publicly verifiable secret sharing to create the randomness for, uh, for the next epoch, which is called coin tossing protocol, uh, what, we, what we do is simply every party generates a random string. Then it shares this random string to, to all the other parties in the MPC. And uh, once, uh, and also for efficiency reasons, it also commits to the string and posts the commitment on the blockchain. And then uh, once this is done, all the parties can just open the commitments and see what the other parties committed to, what was the randomness, and they just XOR it 
and uh, this gives us a random string. But if some party does not open its commitment, then the other parties, the majority of, well, which are the honest parties, can just use the PVSS shares to recover the value that, uh, that uh, the party has committed to. And so in the end, uh, all the par uh, like this, these values will be, will be XORed together, and this gives us the randomness for the next epoch. And we have the guarantees that uh, this randomness is unbiased uh, under the assumption that there is honest majority among the participants in this MPC protocol. Uh, as for practicality, I guess I don't have to tell you that uh, Ouroboros was implemented by OHK. <laughs> and, uh, but from a theory perspective, so about the, <laughs> the practical uh, performance, uh, uh, one can say a, a lot and I will not uh, capture that in these slides, but from the theoretical perspective, actually you can do an analysis of how it compares to Bitcoin in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, what is the probability or how long do you have to wait uh, until you can be 99.9% .9 sure that uh, the adversary cannot run a double spending attack against you. Uh, and this, is of, this number, uh, this time, is of course parameterized by the power of the adversary. So for example, uh, if we have an adversary that controls 10% of hashing power in Bitcoin, then you need to wait 50 minutes to be sure that you're, uh, to have 99.9% .9 certainty that your transaction will be, not be removed from the ledger by a double spending attack. Uh, in Ouroboros, uh, for an adversary controlling 10% of the stake, because uh, we shift from computational power to stake, uh, you have to wait five minutes and so on, right? These are different values for different, uh, for different uh, adversarial power. And uh, there is also this additional uh, column, which, which is called Ouroboros Covered, uh, which, uh, which captures uh, how long you want to wait if you are willing to assume that the adversary in trying to, to, uh, to create this double spending, to run this double spending attack, is not willing to disclose himself. So uh, it's not willing to make any actions that would uh, make it possible to identify that particular party as an attacker. For example, or more specifically, uh, the attacker is not willing to sign two blocks for, for the same slot because this is obviously adversarial behavior since the protocol tells you to only sign a single block. Uh, and so of course, uh, well of course, uh, as you can see from, from the table, uh, the comparison is uh, very much in favor of Ouroboros in compared to Bitcoin and of course you get even better guarantees if you, if you, assume, uh, if you assume covered adversaries, yes? So this is Yes, yes. So that means it's 15 blocks for Ouroboros and 5 for Bitcoin, but because... Yes. But because we produce blocks more quickly, it's still better. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. Okay. Uh, so that would be about Ouroboros. If there are any other questions, uh, maybe now is a good time. And if not, then I would quickly try to sketch uh, how Prowse differs from Ouroboros. Uh, yes? Yes, so uh, for, for, uh, for Ouroboros, uh, the, uh, actually you can actually, you know the optimal strategy that, that follows from the combinatorial analysis. You know uh, what is the optimal way given the slot schedule the leader schedule, what, is, what you should do as the attacker to, to get double spending. For Bitcoin, this is just a particular attack. It might not be optimal. Uh, but that's only, that only makes the comparison more in favor of uh, Ouroboros, right? Uh, because here we are looking at the best attack. Here we are looking at a particular concrete attack. That seems reasonable. So in the Bitcoin case, it's just what you would expect, right? If you want to double spend a transaction, you just create a, a fork and you work on that fork and you hope you will be faster. Uh, okay, uh, so let's, yeah? So for that multi-packet computation, what kind of data for that is stored on the blockchain? Uh, so every party, every party uh, creates a commitment to its randomness and, uh, and, and uh, also the shares of the, the shares for the PVSS. And it's included in the blocks? Yes. Any other questions? Okay, uh, right. So let's let's look at Prowse now. 
Uh, yes, in a nutshell, because we are already over time, but we also started a bit late. Uh, so really, in a nutshell, what Prowse does is that uh, it improves Ouroboros to achieve security in a semi-synchronous communication model. I will tell, say a bit more in detail what that means. And despite fully adaptive corruption, so these are two goals that, that are achieved uh, by it. And uh, the tools that we use to achieve these goals are first uh, local and private leader selection, then uh, forward secure or key evolving signatures, and then uh, we are moving from, from the MPC to, to hashing for, for getting randomness. So randomness will not be completely clean as before with Uroboros, but we give an analysis why, why, this, is, why this is fine. So let me, let me now uh, spend one slide on both of these, uh, both of these uh, goals and the achievements of Prowls and uh, all three of these tools that we use to, to achieve them. So, so you can see these goals as basically strengthenings of the strengthenings of the of the adversarial model, and we strengthen the adversary in two different ways. The first one is that we only assume semi-synchronous communication. So this is a slide that was describing uh, the communication model for Ouroboros, but uh, the red stuff highlights the changes when we move to Prowse. So we still have slots and uh, synchronized watches, but uh, any message that is sent by an honest player is now delivered. Uh, to honest players only within uh, at most delta slots, so there is no uh, guarantee of this synchronous communication, uh, and the adversary has complete control of the, over these delays. So as long as the message, uh, uh, as long as the message is not delayed by more than delta delta slots, uh, the adversary can decide when the message arrives and in which order it, it might arrive to different parties at different times and so on. Uh, and this delta value is not. Uh, known to the protocol. So this is the semi-synchronous model. And the second strength, uh, and we show that the security of Prowse uh, degrades gracefully, gracefully with increasing delta. Of course, you cannot have uh, the same security guarantee as then delta increases uh, arbitrarily, but uh, we show, we describe this process. Uh, this is a difference to Ouroboros, where we basically, if the synchronous assumption was gone, then, uh, then basically you had no guarantees. And the second strengthening of the adversary that we allow is that now the adversary can corrupt any party immediately. So he can just point at the party, and from that point on, he knows the secret state of the party, he can act on its behalf, and so on. The only restriction that the, the adversary still needs to uh, maintain is that uh, it controls minority of the stake throughout the execution, and the stakes has to shift. Uh, we are also assuming that the stake shifts are happening at the bounded rate, uh, just like in Ouroboros. So these are the two ways in which we strengthen uh, the adversary. And now we do several changes to the protocol uh, so that the protocol is sec actually secure against this stronger adversary because uh, we actually also show in the paper that the original Ouroboros would not be secure in this setting. That's, it's not difficult to, to see. Uh, actually, it wouldn't be secure against any of these two strengthenings. Uh, and so the tools that we use and this also, at the same time, covers the modifications that we, that we make when we move from Ouroboros to Prowse. So that one of the tools is a, uh, is a verifiable random, random function. This is a cryptographic function that uh, is like a public key equivalent to pseudorandom functions, uh, if this helps you uh, with imagining it. So you can, you can imagine it as, as two algorithms, uh, evaluate and verify, where the evaluate requires a secret key and then if the evaluate uh, parameterized by the secret key is applied to some input, it produces an output and a proof where the output uh, cannot be obtained without the secret key. It, uh, it is unique and uh, it looks randomly to someone who doesn't know the secret key. Uh, but the proof allows the, the owner of the secret key to prove to everyone else that this is actually the, the correct output for that input. So that's, that's what the verify uh, uh, procedure is for. So anyone with a public key can verify that for a particular input, output, and proof, actually this, the proof proves that this is the correct, unique output for this input. Uh, so it basically outputs a zero or one, depending on whether it's the correct, uh, correct output. So this is a very useful tool. Uh, and this is used in Prowse for leader, for leader selection lottery. So instead of having this public leader, uh, leader schedule that I described in Ouroboros, in, 
In Prowse, uh, the leader selection is local and private, so everyone can evaluate for himself whether he he's a leader for a particular slot. No one else can do it for you. Uh, and then you can convince everyone. If you turn out to be the leader, you can convince everyone that, oh, for this slot, I'm actually the leader, and no one can dispute that. And how is that done? Basically, you, you, you evaluate the, the verifiable random function on the randomness for this epoch and the slot number, and uh, you basically look whether the output actually is below some threshold that depends on the stake. I will not go into how this is actually done, but the more stake you control, the more likely you are that this random value, the pseudo-random value that comes out of the VRF, will be smaller than this function of your stake. And if it is, then it's easy. You can just create the block, and as a, into the block you also uh, input the proof that this is, this is the VRF output, and so everyone can verify that yes, indeed you were eligible to create the block but no one can predict it before that. Uh, and this helps us actually achieve uh, uh, adaptive corruption security because every party, uh, okay, together with some other tools that, that I will talk about. Uh, but uh, this idea was previously used also in Next and Algorand, uh, or a similar idea. Uh, it turns out that you need a special VRF for that with some additional properties because uh, using just a generic VRF would not be sufficient, uh, and we describe in this paper in detail what, what are these properties of the VRF, and we also give an efficient realization of how that should be done. Uh, and the interesting thing is how this changes the dynamics of the protocol is that now that everyone has a local, local election that tells him whether he is a slot leader, we will now suddenly have empty slots, slots where no one was actually elected to be a slot leader, and we will have slots where several honest parties might end up being slot leaders. Uh, these are called multi-leader slots. But they will be sufficiently rare so that uh, this doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, jeopardize the, uh, the security guarantees of the protocol, but it requires this forkable string analysis that I sketched to you to be, to be reworked. Uh, and actually, it also has an interesting consequence that uh, now the protocol can be parameterized by the ratio of empty slots. Basically, depending on how you choose this function phi there, uh, this will determine how often you will have a slot that actually has a slot leader. And uh, these short periods of, uh, of slots that do not have a leader actually allow to the other parties to synchronize because the messages will be delivered in the meantime. Uh, so this allows, uh, this allows us to actually aim for much shorter slots because we don't have to assume that the whole communication is synchronous and that it, the, the message has, arri has to arrive within, this, within the slot. The second tool that is used in Prowse is uh, our key evolving signatures. Uh, so these are special signatures where the public key is fixed, but the secret key can be evolved. So the party that knows the secret key can just make an update step where the secret key is evolved to a new one. And from the new secret key, you cannot de derive the previous one. And this is what we actually do. Uh, and, and then it's imp impossible to forge old signatures with the new keys. So if you only have the new key, you cannot create signatures for the old key, even though the verification, the public key, is still remaining the same. And this is used in Prowse for signing block for the signatures that uh, I told you about. And why is this good? Uh, it helps us with adaptive security, right? So the, the process is actually as follows in Prowse. If you find out via your private lottery that you are a slot leader, uh, remember that by this time no one actually knows that you are a slot leader, only, only you. You create this block that also contains the proof that you are a slot leader. You sign it with your secret key and then you update your key uh, and only then you broadcast the block. So by the time that people learn that you are a slot leader, uh, even if you immediately get corrupted, the attacker can no longer uh, create blocks on your behalf for this slot because your key is already updated and uh, he cannot create signatures for this, for this slot. Okay. Uh, and the final tool that I will only mention is that uh, in Prowse we move away from, uh, from uh, this MPC that was used for, for generating randomness. And instead we, we use hashing, just like at the beginning I told you about hashing, but probably you remember that there was this basic complaint of rejection sampling. And so what we need to do is to be much more careful about the analysis. And uh, the way we prevent rejection sampling to, uh, to jeopardize the security guarantees of the protocol is that uh, we actually include a, a, uh, uh, 
single VRF out output value into each of the blocks. It's included by the, the slot leader that created this block. And then when we want to get the randomness for the next epoch, we hash all these VRF values that were included throughout the whole epoch. And uh, importantly, this gives us the, the leader schedule for the whole next epoch, uh, not, a, not for an individual slot. And this is important because if you remember, uh, if, we, if, the, if the combinatorial analysis tells us that if we sample the slot leaders according to the distribution, if we do one sampling, then there is negligible probability that this, this schedule will be bad in the sense that it will allow forking. Then if we, even if we allow the adversary to resample this several times, but only a restricted number of times, poly polynomially many, but actually one can be much more precise about it, uh, this will not uh, allow the adversary to increase the probability that, uh, that uh, this, uh, this schedule will be, will be bad in the sense that it will allow fork. It will not allow to increase this probability sufficiently, right? Because before it was exponentially small, now it can be increased only polynomially uh, by a polynomial factor. And so even though the adversary can slightly bias the randomness, so the randomness is not perfect now, uh, we can show that this doesn't harm the the consensus properties of the of the ledger. Uh, that was that will be it. That's a, that was a very brief overview of Prowse uh, and how it differs from Wormoros. You can just look at the papers, and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. And thanks for your attention. Thank you.